This is the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Welcome to the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. I'm so thankful that you join us again this month. Thank you for being a part of our leadership community. We honestly believe that when the leader gets better, everyone gets better. Maybe you're new with us. If you are, we release a brand new teaching on the first Thursday of every single month. I would love to encourage you and invite you to subscribe. You can subscribe on iTunes or on YouTube. And I also want to say thank you to those of you that are rating or reviewing the podcast. It makes a big difference. And if this uh, is helpful to you and you can spare a minute or so to write a review or to share on social media, invite others to be a part, that would mean the world to me. I do understand that a lot of you are going through this teaching with your teams. I wanna encourage you on this particular one, especially I think it could be incredibly helpful to gather your core leaders around you and talk about some of the issues. I think it can be really, really, really um, helpful. So let me tell you what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna answer a couple of questions. If you have any questions at all, you can always email me at leadership at life.church. Maybe you have suggestions of what you'd like to hear about, questions, comments, or ideas. Uh, Email me anytime, leadership at life.church. Also, if you want the show notes, we'll be happy to send you those show notes every single month. Just let us know that you'd like them. I'm gonna answer two of your questions. Then we're gonna dive into some new content. At the end, we're gonna review the content so it will hopefully stick better And then I want to bring some application questions. Uh, This is probably the most important thing that we do is we take what we learn and then we try to apply it. So hang with me to the end. I'll try to work hard to keep the content um, impactful and also do it in 25 minutes or less. Let's dive into um, one of the questions that came in. This was from someone who's anonymous. Anonymous is also non-confrontational. So someone asked this question because I'm not a confrontational person. I'm having to battle my desire not to hurt anyone's feelings and yet do what's best for the organization. I realize that I'm being stretched and growing in this role, but it's hard for me to practice or grow in my leadership on real people. What are some steps that you would suggest um, that can help me overcome this struggle? Well, let me just say, first of all, this is a very common struggle. Very few people are naturally confrontational. In fact, If you're naturally confrontational, you're probably not a very nice person. So let's just recognize this is a common issue. Part of the problem, I believe, is that confrontation gets a bad rap. The word confrontation, it just, it it almost has a bad feel to it. Maybe if we rebrand the idea, it might be a little bit um, easier to uh, to get your mind around. Let's reframe the idea of confronting and let's consider it more coaching or simply telling the truth. If you follow my logic, you'll see why confronting others is actually a really good thing to do. Um, What is telling the truth? Telling the truth is one of the most loving things that you can do, right? If you don't tell the truth, that's not loving. Telling the truth is loving. What is confronting? Well, confronting is simply telling somebody the truth. Therefore, confronting somebody with the right attitude or the right heart or the right motives is actually a very loving thing to do. So, In any organization, if you care about somebody, you're gonna care enough to tell them the truth. If you care about your organization, you're gonna care enough to confront. Now, knowing that might help give you the courage to do the right thing, but it still may be difficult to do. How do we learn to confront people? What I would suggest is that you actually role play this. This is something I've done many times, is find somebody that I know and trust and actually talk it through. What are you gonna wanna do? Well, you're gonna wanna start with one positive sentence, and then you want to get into the meat of what you want to say. So you don't want to, you know, shoot the breeze for 10 minutes or so. That's not fair. You're going to get right to the heart of it and say, um, what I'm about to tell you may not be easy to hear, but it's because I love you and value you. And then you tell them the truth. And then you get get into whatever the issue is. You know, when you're late all the time, it impacts, um, it looks bad on the organization. It shows people that you don't care. Maybe you're not performing with excellence and therefore it hurts team morale. Whatever it is, you tell them. And then you you suggest the right behavior. Here's what you can do to improve. And then you ask them, do they understand it? And it's really simple, um, but it just takes practice. So sit down with um, a person and just walk through it and say, you know, what I'm about to tell you may not be easy to hear, but I'm telling you this because I really care and value about you. I care about you. And then point out whatever the behavior is Um, bring a course of correction in your explanation and then ask them, do they understand and ask them to restate it. And if you practice doing that again and again and again, 
on someone who is a real person, but it's not a real game time um, confrontation, what you're going to do is find yourself becoming much more comfortable in confronting, and that will help you to um, strengthen your organization and help people get better. Let's deal with another question. Cindy asked, what advice would you give to someone taking her first leadership role? Well, Cindy, if you just got promoted into a leadership role, congratulations. Um, Three thoughts that come to mind, very simple. Number one, be a student. Number two, love those you lead. And number three, lead by example. My best advice would be this, be a student. Cindy, your ability to learn is one of your most important qualities that any leader will ever have. Leaders are learners. The fact that you're asking that question shows you wanna learn. Even after you've been a leader for 40 years, what are you? You're still a student, always learning. Number two, love those that you lead. The good news is you don't need a title, you don't need position, you don't need power, you don't need a degree in order to lead. What you need is you need trust. You need to care about people. I've said this before, people will follow a leader with a heart faster than a leader with a title. Care about the people that you lead. And number three, lead by example. In other words, simply, be the type of leader that you would love to follow. I love what Coach John Wooden says. He says, the most powerful tool you have in leadership is your own personal example. Be a student, love those that you lead, and lead by example. Let's dive into new content today. The subject I wanna talk about is this. I wanna talk about strengthening a struggling team. Strengthening a struggling team. Let's talk about teamwork for a moment and then we'll dive into the content. If you wanna be incrementally better, be competitive. If you wanna be exponentially better, be a team. Let me say it again. If you wanna be incrementally better, be competitive, be all about you, try to win. If you wanna be exponentially better, be a team because there's no limit to what can be accomplished when it doesn't matter who gets the credit. Uh, Let's be honest, there's nothing like playing on a winning team. If you've ever been in in an organization where you're with very talented people, there's a clear vision and a defined strategy, Uh, people are passionate, everyone's using their gifts to make a difference, that is, that's a place you're gonna to love to work, you're gonna be energized, and there, there are few things more fun than being on a passionate, focus-driven team. On the other hand, there are few things more frustrating than being on an apathetic, lazy, and disengaged team. Unfortunately, the latter is much more common than the former. It's so common in our workplace today to be on teams that just kind of exist, where people are just doing their job, but they're not doing their job um, with others toward a common vision. Uh, In fact, what do you see on a struggling team? You're gonna see um, a team that's lacking in vision. You're gonna see team members that are discouraged. You you may see a, a culture that's unhealthy or perhaps even toxic. What happens? Problems go unaddressed. Everybody knows their problems, but nobody does anything about them. Um, You don't feel like you're winning or you don't even know how to measure success in the organization, and it's no fun at all. Let's talk about teamwork. What is teamwork? Andrew Carnegie said, teamwork is the ability to work together toward a common vision. It's the fuel that enables common people to achieve uncommon results. I love that definition. If you were gonna ask me to boil it down to its simplest form, What is a team? This would be my definition, very simple. A team is a group of people gathered to reach a common goal. That's what it is. We all agree this is what we're trying to do. It's a group of people gathered to reach a common goal. What do you see, though, in most workplaces today? You see a group of people in the same place doing their own thing, thinking about their own concerns. There's a big disconnect between what a team is and what people often do. And you'll hear it even in their language or what they think about. For example, when they come to work, what do they think? If they're thinking like most people, their their thought is, what do I need to do today? In other words, I have to go to meetings, do this project, uh, respond to emails, what do I have to do today? A team member shows up and thinks intuitively, what do I get to do today that moves the mission forward? What do I get to do today that works toward a common goal. Because the reality is an unhealthy team is task-driven, a healthy team is goal-oriented. 
and this this is really important. On an unhealthy team, they're task driven. They're just doing their job. But on a healthy, productive team, we're goal oriented. We're working in the same direction, and you'll see kind of the differences. On an unhealthy team, management wants compliance. They don't want creativity. In fact, if you are innovative, you tend to be punished. Who succeeds、um, on an unhealthy team? Generally, mediocre people.、Uh, it's safest not to take risks. It's safest to blend in. Survival is supreme, and it's every man for himself. If you're on a team like that right now, chances are you have a moderate to a high level of frustration because you know there's something so much better. As a leader, what we need to do is we need to be honest about the state of our team. And what I want to do is, first of all, list five qualities of ineffective teams. Anytime you've got an ineffective or a struggling team, you very likely have one, or more likely, multiple of these qualities on a struggling team. Anytime there's a team that's not winning, what are you going to see? You're going to see one or more of these qualities. You're going to have a team that is void of vision. We don't know what the win is. There's no clear and defined strategy. The team is void of vision. Number two is you've got leaders who deflect responsibility. It's not my fault. It's their fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's the market's fault. It's the economy's fault. It's somebody else's fault. Number three is you've got team members who resist accountability.、Uh, don't tell me what to do. It's not. It's not my. They resist accountability. Number four is you've got team members who avoid conflict, and number five. There are leaders who withhold trust. On any struggling team, you'll see one or more of these issues.、It's, there's going to be void of vision, those who deflect responsibility, those who resist accountability, those who avoid conflict, or those who withhold trust. So, as a leader, you may say, "Okay, well, we have these problems. So, what are we going to do? We've got to get the team healthy. We've got to get everybody on a fun、uh, pace. So, what are we going to do?" One of the most common things I've seen is that a leader says, "Let's go have a team development day." In other words, let's go ride go karts. Let's go do trust falls. Let's go do some kind of adventure somewhere else. And while there's nothing wrong with that, I need to be really clear: that doesn't solve the root issues of struggling teams. What do we need to understand? Any time a team is struggling, is because there's an unhealthy cycle that's going on. There's always an unhealthy cycle in unproductive or unhealthy teams. And as a leader, what we need to do is we have to break the cycle. In fact, let me show it to you. In fact, if you're listening, I'll describe it as clearly as I can.、Um, on this little chart, this is the unhealthy cycle of unhealthy teams. What you've got is you've got wrong actions. People are doing the wrong thing, and that's why we have an unhealthy team. When there's wrong actions, the cycle continues with no confrontation.、Uh, people are avoiding conflict; they're not taking responsibility, so the wrong actions are never confronted. Because they're not confronted, there's casting blame. It's your fault. It's her fault. It's his fault. It's their fault. It's somebody else's fault. That leads to negative assumptions. Well, no one really cares. We can't really improve. Why are we doing this? And that leads to more wrong actions, and this is the negative cycle. In fact, some of you you may recognize at some point under your leadership, this is what was going on. There were wrong actions. You as a leader weren't confronting. People were casting blame. Their negative assumptions, and the negative cycle continues. On the other hand, what we need to do is we need to break the cycle. Any time we've got a struggling or unhealthy team, we need to break the cycle. With productive confrontation, and this is what the different graph looks like. There's wrong actions, and so what do we do? Is we come in and we confront the wrong actions. We do it with the right attitude, the right spirit. We're going to talk a little bit more about how to do that. Then, if we confront in the right attitude, our team's going to start accepting responsibility. Okay, it is my fault. We can do better. There's an issue here.、Uh, the leaders recognize they haven't done everything. We all we're on the same page now. Accepting responsibility moves to positive assumptions. We're all telling the truth here. We're getting things done.、Uh, we're not casting blame. We're recognizing what we need to do to bring improvement. That leads to productive actions, and suddenly you've got a more positive cycle. Anytime there's a negative cycle, what we have to do as a leader is we have to come in and interrupt the cycle. We do it with productive confrontation. It's our role as a leader. We cannot expect anyone else to do this. Productive confrontation. People start accepting responsibility. Then there's positive assumptions, and then there are productive actions. Let's talk about how do we do this as a leader. If we assess our team is not quite as healthy as it should be, and let me tell you right now, 
That's generally the way it is. Teams do not drift toward health by accident. They are shaped towards strength on purpose. Teams never drift to health by accident. They're strengthened on purpose. And so over time, the default is for a team to become less productive and more unhealthy if we don't bring consistent and constant correction. How do we strengthen a struggling team? Uh, the first thing is this. Uh, we're going to diagnose the root of the dysfunction. This is really, really important. We're going to diagnose the root of the dysfunction. Why? Because you cannot change what you cannot define. As leaders, most of the time what we tend to do, and I know I do this, is we tend to focus on the symptoms, not on the root issue. For example, you might say, well, our business isn't growing. Okay, that isn't the problem. That's the symptom of the problem. There's a reason why your business isn't growing. You might say our church is aging. You know, the average age used to be 50, now it's 56. Um, that's not the problem. There, that's the symptom of the problem. We have to get to the root of the problem. You know, our team is negative and critical, okay? That's, that's not the real, why is the team negative and critical? We as a leader have to diagnose the root uh, of the issue. I, I went through this, uh, this kind of little exercise with 26 of the top leaders in our organization. And this is what was really interesting. What I told them is, let's assume that we've got a few team members that are checked out during meetings. So maybe we've got eight people in a meeting and we've got three team members that are checked out. That's a problem. What is the root cause of this problem? And here's what happened. 26 of my top leaders gave me reason after reason after reason that all pointed to the people being the problem. There were eight different team members that responded, the people are the problem. The ninth answer, finally, one of my team members said, well, maybe we as the leader are the problem. And I want you to think about this because this is, this is so true. Whenever there's a problem, we tend to point the finger somewhere else. As a leader, we have to accept responsibility that generally speaking, to some degree, often a large part, we are the root cause of the problem. For example, let's just walk through the exercise. Let's say we've got an eight, eight um, people on our team. Three of the people are constantly checked out during meetings. What could be the problem? Well, it could be that they're all three having personal problems. Not likely, but it could be, okay? Do I have any part of that to own? Well, if there's three team members of mine going through significant personal issues and I don't know, guess what? I'm actually a part of the problem. I should be engaged in the lives of my team members. So ultimately the root issue points back to me. Let's say that those three team members don't understand the direction or they don't feel like they can succeed. Is it their fault or, their, or my fault? Well, maybe it's partially their fault, but ultimately maybe it's my fault for not clearly communicating the direction. Maybe... The meeting is unnecessary, unproductive, or a waste of time. Maybe those three people are the sharpest people in the room. The other five are just kind of the mediocre ones hanging on. And the reality is I'm boring them like crazy. And ultimately, it points back to me. I'm not creating a, an environment that's helpful or productive. Maybe those three team members have a bad attitude. That's partially their responsibility. It could be partially mine. Why? Because I tolerated it and I didn't address it months and months ago so often we need to recognize as the leader, the root cause of the problem more often than not points toward us. Diagnose the root cause of the problem and recognize this is so difficult. As leaders, we need to understand more often than not, some, the root lies somewhere close to our own leadership. Diagnose the root cause of the problem. Uh, I'd love to talk more about how to do that. We made another episode, but this is really important. Don't just focus on the symptom. Ask yourself, why is this occurring? And more often than not, we're gonna, it's going to be a reflection of our own leadership. Then we recognize what the, the root issue is. We're going to confront the root issue. You, you cannot correct what you won't confront. We're going to confront. In fact, we answered a question about that earlier. It's the loving thing to confront. It's the right thing to confront. It's the healthy thing to confront. It's unhealthy to avoid behavior and you can never have a good team unless you're confronting wrong behaviors. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna point out the wrong behavior. Now, this is important. We're not attacking people. We're talking about behavior. We have to be real clear on this. Where I'm not coming after you as a person, what I'm doing is we're addressing this behavior. Then we may correct the person privately or we may actually correct the behavior publicly, and this matters a lot. There's a time to correct publicly because it actually occasionally will do the offender a favor 
to let everyone else know that this this behavior has been addressed publicly. No one is wondering, and everyone understands that as a leader, we're we're not going to tolerate this on the team. We have higher standards. We're going to offer the person a path to improvement, and then when they improve, we're going to celebrate. If they don't improve, guess what? We're going to remove them because we're not going to tolerate underperformers bad attitudes or divisiveness on our team because our team is moving in a healthy direction. So let me review these big thoughts. Um, If you've got an ineffective or struggling team, here's what you're gonna see. You're gonna see a team that is void of vision. You're gonna see team members that tend to deflect responsibility. You're gonna see team members who resist accountability. You're gonna see those who avoid conflict and you're gonna see leaders who withhold trust. What do we have? We've got a problem. We've got a destructive cycle. So we need to correct the destructive cycle. Whenever there's wrong actions, what, what, why are there wrong actions? Because there's no confrontation. Because there's no confrontation, there's casting blame, there's negative assumptions, there's more wrong actions. What we're gonna do is we're gonna interrupt the cycle. We're going to confront in a productive way. And as we do so, suddenly we're all going to accept responsibility then there's gonna be positive assumptions, and then we're gonna see productive actions. What do we do as a leader when we've got a struggling team? We diagnose the root of the dysfunction. Most leaders focus on symptoms. The great leaders are gonna focus on uh, the root of the problem. Then we're going to confront the root issue. You cannot correct what you're unwilling to confront. We're not attacking, we're not attacking people, we're attacking the wrong type of behavior. Bottom line is, let me just say this, as leaders, we have to have the courage to admit that we're very likely a part of the root problem. Uh, I think it's John Maxwell who says, everything rises and falls on leadership. Whenever things are going well, it almost always is because there's a great leader. When things are struggling, we have to we look to the leader. Everything rises and falls on leadership. If there's a team that's not performing well, we own it. It could be that we've allowed the wrong team members to be on the team. It could be that we're not addressing the problems. It could be that we're not correcting the wrong type of behavior, but we need to recognize more often than not, we are the root cause. Diagnose the root and address the root. Three questions, and these are really important. Question number one, on a scale of one to 10, how healthy and strong is your team and why? On a scale of one to 10, how healthy and strong is your team and why? Now. Here's the fun part. Now ask your team and let them respond anonymously. How healthy is your team and why? You put your answer. Now ask your team and let them respond anonymously. And here's my guess. More often than not, the leader tends to score the team higher than the rest of the team. If there's a significant disconnect, guess what? We have a problem. We need to get to the root of the problem and see why the team isn't as healthy in the eyes of our team members as it is in ours. And the reality is because we often don't have the clearest objective view of what's really going on in the organization. Scale of one to 10, how healthy is the team and why? Now ask your team. Number two, what quality is the weakest on your team? This is super important. Okay, on any struggling team, there's gonna be, they're void of vision. If your team is not doing well, guess what? It could be because you're not pointing toward the win. This is who we are. This is what we're stand for. Here's our vision and the clear and defined strategy to get there. It could be that there's deflecting responsibility. Not my fault, it's everybody else's fault. It could be that you're resisting accountability. Well, it's their department and you can't tell me what to do and this is the way we do it here. We've always done it this way. That could be the problem. It could be they're avoiding conflict. Everybody knows there's a problem going on and nobody's talking about the problem. That is a very big problem. It could be that there's withholding trust. We're not vulnerable with each other. We're not extending trust. We're, we're not cooperating. We're competing with one another. This is really important. Define of these five, which one or two are, is weakest on your team. Are you void of vision? Are you deflecting responsibility? Are you resisting accountability? Are you avoiding conflict? Or are you withholding trust? Number three, super important. Once you've named a problem area or a symptom, what is the root cause of the problem? Once you've named the problem, what is the root cause of the problem? And here's where the rubber meets the road. What will you do to address the root? You may say, Craig, that's complicated. Leaders deal with complicated issues. I'm not sure what to do. Well, you're the leader. Keep asking questions. Keep pressing in. 
Keep doing what leaders do. You are where you are because you have the gift of leadership. You're not perfect, but you're getting better every single day. Diagnose the root and lead to where things are supposed to be. That's what great leaders do. When the leader gets better, everyone gets better. Thank you again for joining us. I'll be with you again this time next month. Thank you for sharing on social media. Leaders, be yourself. Why? Because people would rather follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right. Hey, thanks again for joining us here at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode or want to find additional resources, show notes, or maybe even a past episode, you can find all of that on our website at life.church slash leadership podcast. There you can also sign up to have all of these resources sent directly to you via email. And one of the things you can do to help get the word out is by rate, review, and subscribing to this podcast on iTunes. It's a great way for you to help actually build leaders around the world and get the word out. Thanks again for joining us here on the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. We'll see you next time.